Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. That was an amazing start to the to the two days. Um, really interesting things discussed. And like I mentioned briefly in um, my welcome this morning, this session was of particular interest to me because it included some of these artists that we have really been focusing on and researching on and exhibiting at Tate over the past few years. And it also included some people that I didn't know of and wasn't aware of, particularly the group of Swedish um, photographers. So that's, this type of exchange and discovery is, is really great and really important for these um, this, over the next two days. Um, I thought we'd start by just briefly acknowledging, um, Liz, when you said in, your first, um, in the first talk about this really amazing fact that there is these two uh, major exhibitions in London of female photographers, Lee Miller at the Imperial War Museum and um, Christina Broom at um, the Museum of London. And this is a really important thing to acknowledge, actually, that, that there are these things taking place. And similarly, there is a major retrospective of um, Ishiuchi's work at the Getty in LA. And there's also a major retrospective of the series that Sabina talked about by Zavia Radet at the Museum of Modern Art in Warsaw. Um, and this is really a great year for photography and women. And um, although there is lots that still needs to be done, we're also in a really um, positive place at the moment. And I hope everyone's been to see the shows. Um, so what really interested me about this uh, group of artists and why we put you all together actually in this first panel was the fact that, um, first of all, when we were shifting through the papers aesthetically, there was this instant similarity between how these artists were working with photography at this certain moment in time. So this really grainy black and white aesthetic, um, this shift between documentary practice, personal practice, and this idea of performance coming into it. And also the fact that we're in a, a similar point in time, we're in the 1960s and 70s and 80s, but we're looking at this period on a global perspective. So we're in post-war Poland, a very particular um, situation in Eastern Europe, we're in post-war Japan, again, a very different time period, and then in Sweden, which is probably um, a little bit less um, problematic in those post-war years, but still a period of discovery for many artists and many photographers. Um, so I'll just open up with a few questions specifically about the individual talks, and then we'll have some time to um, discuss things further. But Anne, when you were speaking um, and introducing the three photographers, what really occurred to me was this shift or what I saw as a shift going from the social documentary practice or straight documentary practice to this idea of a much more performative practice and the personal. And this um, difference in artists either directing um, a group of people in front of a camera in a very particular narrative storyline or the idea of the artist herself actually getting in front of the camera and putting herself as the subject. And this really, I feel, links back to the idea of the performative and performance, which is quite different from what was happening in, in Sweden at the time, I think. Yes, absolutely. I, um, I think that um, uh, you can talk about um, relations to performance, but I, I don't think uh, they ever um, thought about that. I mean, I think that's something we see now, that, that this is what they are doing. Um, but all three of them were, of course, very aware of what was going on in, at the photography scene. And as I said, the documentary tradition um, was very strong in, in, uh, in Sweden or in Scandinavia, I should say, during um, the 60s and 70s. So working with art photography, doing something else, was then you did something um, that was not representative. You did something else. Uh, and also being a woman photographer, that was um, problematic. Or you did something new. Or it was maybe a, a, an advantage that you were a woman photographer. You could really, you were some, you could explore, you could um, uh, try out new things. Uh, and, and, and they did. And I guess the next follow-on step from that was when you then um, 
characterize them in relationship to um, feminist practice mm. internationally. Mm. And I wonder whether, because actually when I was doing some research on these, for me, unknown artists, I was making these links between Anna Mendieta and mm. Francesca Woodman mm. and other types mm. of um, performative feminist practices. And do you know or have they spoken about these type of relationships internationally at the time? Not no, necessarily they have with not. photography. And of course, um, I mean, uh, this is something uh, I could have asked them. They are still uh, active, all of them. Uh, but I don't think they have, they were, um, I, I think that Toya Lindström was aware of, of this, uh, what was happening. But Eva Claesson and Agneta Ekman was really in the photography world. They were uh, photographers, so I didn't think they really were, were aware of what was happening. But I mean, you, you don't know, but I think it's really uh, an interesting thing to to put them together with these artists instead of the photographers because they are I mean they are trying things it's very uh, they're not doing the same thing but you can see that there are their themes and what they are working on is the same ideas yeah and actually maybe we should go to Liz now on this topic um, this idea because this, this is something we try and do at Tate um, with Photography. We try and show photography alongside other mediums, so it's not um, a medium that sits on its own in the gallery space. We try and make these links and connections and integrate it into other practice. So thinking about what we, you were talking about historically over the past 30 years and how photography has been shown or written about, um, have you seen this shift between or is there a benefit in making these links more widely across art history? It depends whether what you're talking about is photography as a specific medium with its own particular technical and aesthetic properties, in which case you're working within photography, or whether what you're talking about is the themes and debates that women's photography in a broader context of feminist debates might represent. Mm -hmm. So, for example, a journal like Feminist Review, which is still running, and mm -hmm. Uh, I looked at the last issue, obviously, because I was looking at a, an early one, and very interestingly is much more international. One of the articles was about uh, women in Egypt now, for instance. Mm. Uh, if you're asking questions about women's practice, of course you have to look at academic research, women's writing, life writing, poetry, as well as the visual arts, as well as film and possibly music. So. I think it depends what question you're asking as to whether or not you see photography as a sort of relatively autonomous sphere of practice mm. or whether you insert photography into a much broader question, a set of questions about creativity. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I was thinking this came to mind because during these talks I was thinking a lot about collaboration, particularly mm. in relation to the photo book and what it meant to be making a photo book as a photographer in Japan in the 70s and whether you were, you were looking to your designer or your editor or your publisher as a collaborator rather than um, someone that was involved in the work as well and almost co-authoring it. And this was something that was really interesting, um, Reset, when you mentioned the first edition of one of um, Ishiuchi's books had a, had a afterward by Araki which was then removed later on. Um, yeah. And I wondered how, well, that's a, another issue, but I wondered how, um, if early on she was having more collaborative relationships with um, some of the designers and editors she was working with, and how that has changed or expanded in these later re-editions. Hmm. Well, I think when she first began, I mean, she was just coming out of her student years, and she actually continued to work with, I didn't have enough time, Kimura, who was her designer for the trilogy, the Yokosuka trilogy, who she continued to work with later on when she was in a position to bring in the designer for a project. Mm -hmm. But I think now as she's gotten much better known and her time is also not as open as it was before and she was self-financing, basically her father was self-financing them. Mm -hmm. She was working for his accounting company for many, many years up until just, I'd say, maybe 10 or 15 years ago. Um, so now the books are being done by people like Andrew Roth, who come in and bring in the designer and will bring in someone to write the essay uh, in consultation with her. But I don't think it's as hands-on day-to-day 
as it was with those first few books. Yeah. yeah. But she will request a certain designer if the opportunity is afforded. Yeah. So. And just the idea of the photo book was something that was a similarity that ran through lots of the um, artists we've talked about this morning. And this, I guess for me, the significance and importance of the photo book of, as a mode of communication for a lot of these artists, it was the prime um, way that their work was being seen if they didn't have exhibitions or gallery shows at the time. Um, and maybe we'll come back to this a little bit later about how, um, when these books now become very expensive and out of print and we show them in museums, these things that were really meant for communication then become an object and um, how that sits historically and how they were shown at the time and now. Well, I think in Japan at that time, there were very few galleries. Mm -hmm. And so the opportunity to show prints on the wall was not the main way that one would show the work. They would show it in the photo book format. So the distribution of the photo book was the exclusive means. And uh, I think you know, now what we're grappling with is these women are being shown in museum settings. And so how do you take an object that you look at in your lap, that you turn the pages, where sequencing is something that's quite important, and translate that to the museum environment? And so that seems to be you know, a big debate and a, a point that still is being explored. And uh, I don't know if we'll find a resolution, because they're quite expensive. And so the reprints hopefully, hopefully are a substitution at that. There's also this, um, this physical aspect that a photo book is very personal in a way. You look at it one-on-one -on -one and you have one-on-one -on -one engagement with it. And then if you want to show that series of work and you install it in a very large space or you, you change the context of the yeah. work in a way, and particularly for some of these practices that are very, um, the approach is much more personal and intimate, that can create a real shift in how things are shown. And Sabina? <laughs> I was actually just thinking, Redette did, she, she published Little Man as a book, but the, uh, the record was uh, intended to be exhibited. Uh, there's no, as far as I know, kind of a big catalogue resume or kind of a book about the record, although one needs to be done. But for Ridda, uh, she wanted to publish in magazines, exhibit as much as she could, really to kind of give these images the permanence that she was seeking to create. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a letter in her archive where she talks about trying to spread out, uh, you know, send, send publications or send mm -hmm. catalogues to as many places as possible, because in case a bomb dropped in one place, others would survive in others. So, uh, yeah. There's, it's definitely a priority for Redette as well, but maybe for a different, a different, a different reason. reason. Um, Zafira Redette's work really fascinated me. I knew a lot of her earlier work, which is much more, um, it almost comes from this history of surrealist collage. Yeah. And, um, I almost showed a series called Awaiting, uh, which is a series of portraits of women, and their faces have been collaged with kind of stone sculptures, because it kind of tied yeah. into some of the themes that I was talking about. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they're very surrealist, very graphic, um, quite different to the work that she was making in yeah. the record. But she was working over a very long period of time, so mm -hmm. things change. Yeah, <laughs> That's the other thing to note. Um, some of the series we've discussed this morning, um, some of the artists have very long, um, expansive careers that, that go over 20 or 30 or 40 decades. And others we're talking about, we're talking about very specific bodies of work, and, and they were only actually practicing for a very short period of time. So I think that also changes the context in which we see them now. Um, definitely for me, Ishiuchi's work has changed dramatically in terms of aesthetic over the past three decades. Um, and her work in the 70s was very much associated with that provoke aesthetic. And now, um, she, for me, she's actually become a lot more performative and a lot more personal. And making large colour works, it's very, very different. So you really see this progression of artists over time as well, which is nice. A nice when we're revisiting things like this. Yeah. Um, just before we open it up to questions, I'd like to speak a little bit more about Zafira Redette and just this, the sheer volume of material that, that she was documenting and whether um, she was collaborating with anyone at the time, what she was, how she was really managing this, this extensive project. Well, I don't think she really was managing it. Uh, she was just constantly going out and taking photographs day after day. Um, and like I say, not, not even printing them, they were just kind of stored. 
before, I think the archive began to be digitised maybe 2011, or that could be wrong, um, but before that they were all just kept in boxes, um, just kind of untouched because of the sheer size of this. But it does pose an interesting question, now that redette has gone, it's the, the archive is in the hands of her family, and her, she doesn't have any children, interestingly. She says, there's another letter in her archive where she says, I've got no time for kind of feminine pastimes like cooking and cleaning, I've got too many pictures to take. Um, <laughs> But uh, her family, her, she didn't have children, but her brother's family often accompan accompanied her on, on the trips that she took. Uh, and now they are the ones that are, um, are kind of preserving and uh, exhibiting this archive. And also going back to a lot of these places to try and find the people that Redette photographed. Uh, and to kind of, when there are no names, find names, and to fill in backstories around, around the, the images as well. But yeah, what to do with them all? It's quite a, a tricky question. Well, I guess it's a really... Oh, yeah. I just wanted to ask a follow-up question mm. to that, which was uh, uh, what you think being... It's around the idea of the woman's eye, what you think being a woman photographer brought to the possibility of actually making that project. Um, how did the... You know, were there public and private sort of sphere issues? Were there male photographers who were working perhaps on more public areas of, of activity or whatever? I don't know. Well, she also but it seems to me to be a sort of... I'm not saying what... Just being a woman, being able to create some of those very intimate portraits, do you mm. think that's a relevant um, element? Yeah, potentially. Although it's not something that I've kind of focused, I haven't really thought about too much, but largely because there's so much work that I haven't seen before. So um, in, the, in the more performative portraits, I think it's uh, interesting. But again, I mean, I've literally only just kind of found these because they're mm -hmm. only available now. Yeah. So it's something that needs to be, to be thought about. There is a sense that she, uh, she was able to gain people's trust mm -hmm. in entering these houses. Um, she's quite, although she was quite an old lady, she had quite a lot of vigour uh, and she'd kind of force her way in, shake hands. She thought it was very important to shake hands and kind of make a direct contact and immediately kind of um, compliment something in the house that she thought was beautiful. So she kind of put them at ease and uh, mm -hmm. in a way that perhaps some of her male counterparts wouldn't have been able to do. But also maybe her age came into play as well to kind of access these spaces. Yeah. Yeah. 67 she started. Yeah. Yeah. 67. Yeah. yeah. And I wonder whether making this, making her subject so broad and such an overarching um, project enabled her to um, really focus in on quite controversial subcultures and almost hiding the fact that she was interested in those things or documenting those things in a way by umbrellaing it, yeah. umbrellaing it yeah. under yeah. such yes. a huge yeah. project. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. She was actually herself quite politically engaged. Mm. So if you look at photographs of her own apartment, there's solidarity signs and mm. she donated works for auction in support of solidarity. Mm. Uh, and she also participated in church exhibitions during martial law, martial law because you weren't able to exhibit publicly. Mm. So, I mean, there was a lot of mm. kind of... She was uh, engaged in this very much herself. So maybe, mm. yeah, she kind of tried to sneak these uh, sneak these things in under this huge, huge, uh, huge project. I wonder if we should give an opportunity for questions and then maybe come back to some discussion if, if anyone's ready, ready for discussion yet. Do we have anyone that would like to pose some questions to our panel? Not yet, we're still warming up. Okay, <laughs> one over here. <laughs> We'll just wait for, we have to wait for the microphone because we're recording it before we talk. Working, is it? Yeah. Yes, about the, ac the economic aspect of this, because we're talking about archives and who owns the archives and what's actually happened and the photo books being published in Japan. I don't think I saw which publishers were publishing it. Thinking about Vivian Mayer and what's happening with her archive. Just do any of the panel have anything to say about the fact that finance, economy is an important part of what women photographers do and how that's played out during their life and subsequently in terms of ownership, digitizing and the revenue that's generated from it that seems to happen in hindsight quite often. 
I, can, um, I was speaking with the family not so long ago, and um, the project is still in, uh, in continuation because they need to kind of find the money to, to kind of do this. There's a huge amount of time and a huge amount of money. Just uh, I think they've done about 7,000 now, but there's still so much more to do, and it will only continue through things like, um, well, funding, through you know, making her work public in exhibitions in Warsaw and this kind of thing, and promoting her work. But, I mean... Um, actually, I had interviewed all three women prior to um, writing the paper. And one of the things that was very interesting that Ishiuchi said to me was that the women that came before her, who were well known, who were artists, Yoko Ono and Kasuma, came from very wealthy families. And they had the financial means yeah. Yeah. to travel abroad where they gained recognition. And those that remained in Japan did not have that financial possibility. So it did take quite a bit longer, and they did have to kind of rely on support from family or other jobs in order to finance. And many of the books are self-published. So that is family money or friends coming together, in the case of Ishikawa, to fund a project. <coughs> Can I also add, um, Rudette was herself from a wealthy family, but uh, during the war, they were all relocated. So they were in a, a region that's now the Ukraine, Sanaswavov, uh, and they moved now. They moved then to the kind of southwest area, leaving all behind all their kind of money and possessions. Um, and she did work. She worked. She she taught photography at the at the time. Uh, she was making this series as well. So she didn't have kind of means herself, even though she did in the past. But they, they were kind of lost after the war. Mm. When it comes to the three uh, Swedish photographers, all of them worked also commercially. So these are their private, more artistic projects that I presented. Um, and, and of course, Agnet Ekman was able to make a book, and it was a publisher who supported, su supported the, the book, mm -hmm. of course. Um, and Eva Klasson, she also worked with this very exclusive artist book with um, with um, uh, a publishing company who, uh, who helped her. But it's said, uh, when you open it, it said that there's supposed to be 1,000 copies, but she told me that there was not 1,000, <laughs> there was a few hundreds maybe, and they didn't sell at, at all. And just about the, the photo books in relation to the three Swedish photographers. Um, definitely in London, and I think um, with contemporary practitioners, the photo book has, ha has had a huge revival in recent yeah. years, um, possibly stemming from the popularity of Japanese photo books and, and the revival of the Provoke generation. Um, are there re-editions and reissues of these really key works, or um, not necessarily by the three women we've spoken about today, but by other Swedish photographers? Yes, absolutely. There's a, a, a big interest in in the photo book, as you said, and also so there has been uh, several facsimile editions of some of the important photo books in the history of Swedish photography for by photographers like Christian Strömholm, but also this book uh, by Agneta Ekman, which I think is is really interesting that they wrote that up. Mm. And they're putting the two alongside, which yeah. is nice. Um, any more questions? One up the back here, and then we'll come down the front. Hello. Following on from that question, really, I'm quite interested in what all of you, including Liz, despite her cold, if you can also chip in, that would be great. Think of the, the sort of interplay of space and time, or place and time, uh, in this? Is it more important when a photographer is working to become known or where they are to become known? And just in parentheses, I mean, my recent experience has been working on the archive of my mother's photography. And she, for opposite reasons, um, travelled, not because she was rich and wanted to go abroad like Yoko Ono or something, but because she was a refugee when she came here. So she was pushed out by Hitler, but she came from a place and a time where photography, and particularly women's photography, was very, very established in Vienna mm -hmm. since, you know, 100 years ago and through to the 30s. And then the lights went out and all the 200-plus uh, women's photo studios disappeared. But some of those photographers turned up in other places, as we know, and that gave the impetus to their work here. And I'm very interested in, you know, do, do you need this vortex of the right time and the right place, or do you make your own history 
and, and, and create a new kind of place and time for your own work and your own voice. Do you have a few? Yeah, that's a really interesting <laughs> question. Um, very complicated as well. I don't think Rudette's project could have taken place. It, her project is tied to a very specific moment and kind of charting this transition at this particular moment. So, I mean, I think it's very much tied to the moment of its creation. But not necessarily, but discovering it or it, but rediscovering it and, and it becoming available to the public isn't necessarily mm. key to... Is, it's okay that we're now um, being exposed to this work now rather than in 1990 when she finished the project. Mm. <laughs> Obviously, the co I guess the interesting thing about this question is the context changes because we're looking at it from a different historical perspective. And then the view of our work, the work changes. And um, <coughs> there is this uh, risk of rewriting history in a, in a way that's perhaps not 100% um, truthful or, or taking a very different angle on things. Um, but definitely, I think, throughout the history of photography, there are these um, rediscoveries when um, bodies of work are found, when archives are found, um, or when... Um, museum exhibitions that happened many, many years ago are researched again. Particularly this exhibition that happened at MoMA in 1974 of new Japanese photography. Yeah. I've been recently looking at this show and there are some of these figures in this exhibition that had this one international showing and then were never on the radar again for yeah. decades. Yeah, and that, and that was actually the only show. The, the one at ICP was the only show that Ishiuchi was in, mm -hmm. but the MoMA show had absolutely no women at all. Yeah. So. But isn't it more a question of histories rather than history? Something more mm. akin to waves that advance and recede and, you know, every seventh wave is perhaps a little bit stronger and yes. that actually there are moments where uh, what women photographers have been doing in particular places, in particular circumstances, get revisited mm -hmm. because of new developments relating to those places or to the places where the photographs have ended up. Uh, so I don't. I think it's a false binary, actually. Mm. I, th I think we have to think, as you say, in much more complex ways, and perhaps not to be expect not to be able to answer that question. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I mean, if it come, if I'm thinking of Eva Clausen, I mean, she she um, she had a lot of exhibitions. Actually, it was quite well known in Paris and in, in France, and she also had exhibitions in Stockholm, but. Um, the time was not right for it. Was too advanced in a way you can mm. say her photo, her photography, and so. But now we have seen much more, and we are open to yeah. this kind of work, and think it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. But of course, in a way, you can also see her as a kind of a forerunner for the the artists that we see uh, today, uh, women photographers working in with with this themes or but but I mean they didn't know of Eva Clausen's work for example in the beginning of the 1990s yeah. but you can compare their work and see that they yeah. that she yeah. worked with the yeah. same kind of yeah. issues but but as I said the um, the rewriting of the history is um, my point was that some people think now that she I think she get too much attention that she is now in, she's included now in the history of Swedish photography. And that is it. No, no, she was not, she was not so important. But, well, I, 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 this is something I, I, I think it's interesting how she's now well known, but then it goes, you know, she's too, she get too much, much attention now. It's also something to do with networks as well, which we'll talk about in another session later on. Um, there was a question here in the middle. If we just wait for the microphone to come through. Is that working? Yeah. You, you, several of you spoke about how some of these women photographers collaborated with somebody else. I, I wondered if there's any information about any of them working collectively um, in, in the sense that they might have been in a group or um, have shared skills or you know th that their work method would have been collective because that seems to there was some of that in the 
in the 70s and early 80s. And yeah. I, I wondered if you knew of anything. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in, in particular with the Japanese women in the mid-70s, 1976, there's a very well-known show of which I showed one of the slides called Hiyako Ryoan, which is called Riot of Flowers. And it was 10 women collaborating together to create a show and create a group exhibition. And there were others similar to that in Japan. Um, and they are now being documented in history books. So. Um, Ridette wasn't working in a group as such, but she was part of this local photographic society. And actually, a lot of the really exciting work happening in photography in Poland takes place in these kind of regional, small clusters around the photographic societies. Um, so people like Lefchensky uh, was also part of the of the of the group and they didn't necessarily work together but it was an atmosphere where they would show each other their works and kind of go on you know journeys together uh, and kind of share skills and you know techniques about how to how to make these uh, but also a place where they could get information about what was going on abroad there's a really wonderful quote from a Polish photography critic about the Gliwice Photographic Society, and he says he always loves he always loves to go to this invigorating uh, environment because uh, alongside good black coffee, you'll always find uh, a hot discussion on art photography and and you know, the latest copies of hard to find European photography magazines. So um, it was a useful kind of group for, for for kind of networking in that way as well. <coughs> Uh, Agne Reekman, as I said, was in this inner circle of around Christer Strömholm and uh, another photographer, Tori van Odolf. And also, he, she didn't know all the, the photographer who is today very well known. But she left. But she, in the beginning, in the, in, during the 1960s, when she was at the school and so on, she, she collaborated with a lot of other uh, photographers. Um, um, and uh, uh, Toya Lindström has always been um, working together with, with other photographers. She has been, um, um, well, uh, in, uh, been presenting her works in, in exhibitions together with other and others and so on. Mm. Eva Clausen is maybe the one who has not, she, in the beginning when she was very young, she had friends and all of them were photography assistants and, for different Swedish photographers, but I think then she left. Mm -hmm. But there's a distinction between the collective generation of ideas and generation of work and collaboration when uh, photographers come together having made work mm -hmm. to then find an exhibition theme, find an audience and set up dialogues between their work, isn't there? Mm -hmm. uh, which I sense is at the heart of your question. Yes, I was thinking about the Hackney Flashers. Yeah, and um, Format, for example, of course. Yes, and, yeah. and, and the Half Moon Gallery. Did, did yes, have, exactly, the, yeah. The ideas came from yeah. collective thought rather than, as you say, it's a difference. Collective debates and long, yes. long nights. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes good black coffee. <laughs> <laughs> um, did we have another question from the back? Yeah, just in the middle at the back, yeah. This is a, a kind of specific question for Anna relating to Swedish photography history. Um, I wanted to have your thoughts on why Swedish photography history always returns to Christer Strömholm. And you remarked about him in, in your talk. I was wondering if there was any room within Swedish photography to, to kind of bypass his or find another way of talking about Swedish photography without returning to him, as always. Um, <laughs> I was wondering if you have any thoughts on that, considering that the exhibition that you curated started from him specifically. Well, of course it is, but I, I think um, um, in a, to be able to explain the Swedish scene during these years, you have to mention uh, his, his name because he has been really influential, or uh, also other photographers around him. I, I mean, I could have mentioned Anders Petersen and uh, today J.O. Engström, for example, as, I mean, continuing in this tradition. So I think that's, um, that's why um, everything always come back to Christer Strömholm and why he's, he's one of the few Swedish photographers who's uh, known outside Sweden. So, um, 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 but um, 
I think it's important when, if you start with him to, to, to show that there are other photographers, of course, and there are also other traditions, of course, within uh, Swedish photography. But when these three, they, they came out in a way from this way of working on or talking about photography as Christer Strömholm did. So I don't know if that was the answer to your question. Or yeah. I guess a similar thing also happens in Japan with people like Araki and Tomatsu and Mariyama. We always refer back to these key figures um, also as a way to kind of put us in a specific location and context, I think, um, yeah, as historians. There were other movements besides Provoke yeah, that were exactly. happening at the time. But of course, in the West, the one it's we the know well is Provoke because there have been the exhibitions yeah. and there was the Moriyama show here at the Tate yeah. a few years ago. Um, but there are people like Kitai mm -hmm. who are working at the same time, who are doing protest imagery that is relating to the street riots that are going on at the time. So um, it, it is quite broad. But mm -hmm. I think as a movement first becomes known, we kind of hold on to several key figures yeah. to help us define it. And then our curiosity expands and we go beyond that to understand that it is not such a neat package and there are mm. many people who are working in many, many different ways mm. outside of you know, the one recognized <laughs> provoke in this case. Mm. One, one a bit funny story with Eva Claesson, it's now when she has been presented in this uh, later years, uh, it has been said that she was a student of Christer Strömholm, but she was only for two or three weeks at his photo school and then mm. left for Paris. <laughs> and so she met Christer Strömholm later in Paris when they, I mean, they, be, they became friends and he visited her, uh, visited her uh, exhibitions. But well, so, so this is something we have to rewrite, the history around her. Yeah. These rumours often perpetuate, so <laughs> we have to kind of keep hold of it. Was there any final questions? One down the front here. I was just wondering about the uh, relationship between the desire to take photographs and then the desire to show the work, really starting with Redette's kind of, the sort of strange paradox between sort of desperately wanting to take all these photographs but actually barely printing any of them and just sort of wondering how she, whether she kind of um, sort of talked through that process or whether it was part of this trying to kind of keep ahead of some sort of, um, sort of sense of change or death coming up. Um, and in relation to that, just Eva Clausen, because I don't know about her, this idea that she just kind of leaves photography and then sort of what her relationship is to her legacy of her photographs and how they're being shown now. I would say that Redette, although she didn't print that as many as she would have liked because of the sheer volume there was still plenty that appeared in public um, so there's an exhibition of the work in 1979 but in a group exhibition it was mainly kind of conceptual work and hers kind of stood out as being quite quite different there was an exhibition of the record a exhibited in 1980 uh, and she'd spent quite a lot of time organising how she wanted these images to be kind of uh, grouped and, uh, and shown and then she got to the exhibition and they just basically papered a whole wall with, with just a, like a grid of all these images and she was horrified by it. And I think the exhibition in Warsaw at the moment is a kind of restaging of the exhibition that she wanted to, to stage based on all the notes that she'd made. So she was still exhibiting. And I mean, partly the idea was to make it visible, to kind of show people this, uh, to give it that sense of permanence. Uh, and you do get exhibitions um, going on like in, in the 80s as well uh, of her work. So it is seen. I'm just the, the point of saying that she hasn't printed them all is just because there's so, so many of them. Uh, but yeah, it was partly this kind of uh, like obsession. She called herself, she likened herself to like an alcoholic. Like it was her vodka, this <laughs> photography, constantly trying to, to take all these photographs. So there's a kind of uh, a, a difficulty there. Mm. Yeah. Yes, it's a, it's a very good question. Uh, what uh, the legacy of Eva Claesson. She has now uh, another name. Um, and as I said, uh, I told you, she, she entered it, this religious community. So she has, she's another person today. So actually she's working now on, on the photographs by Eva Claesson, but that's someone else, that's not her. Mm -hmm. But she, I mean, she's, I mean, uh, uh, she, she, um, 
she's very proud of her work. She said it's good, and she now is of course very, very happy with what is happening with her, with her um, archive and her photographs, <coughs> and, and actually that we have them now uh, in the collection also. So. Um, um, yeah, it's um, it's something that someone else, uh, a young artist, did in the 1970s, and, and she's working with it, but it's not her now. I think that's a really good um, point to finish on, particularly because we're talking about legacies and how these works um, from the 60s and 70s and 80s can be shown now. And that's pertinent to what we do here at the museum and um, what we do as curators and art historians. Um, so good things to think about. Thank you.